Hello everyone. Today I'm just going to do a quick geology lecture. I'm not going to do an intro or anything like that because this is an update on my Frida Formation project. As most of you who follow me may already know, the Frida Formation or Frida Sandstone, which it dominantly is considered to be a sandstone, there's other lithologies in there but we'll touch on that later, is a mesoproterozoic, at least expected to be, sandstone that filled the mid-continent rift at after it failed in the Lake Superior region. It has a lot of extensive outcrops and stuff like that. We're going to focus on one place in particular because I want to talk about how field work ties into lab work and geology. And unlike with the Jacobsville group, which I redefined probably five years ago now, no one's pulling detrital zircons from these. Okay, I'm not going to get into depth about why I'm pulling detrital zircons. I'm just going to tell you the gist of it, because detrital zircons we cannot use to directly date a sedimentary rock unit, which the Frida is, but we can get it to get a maximum age. Like if our youngest zircon is 1.06 billion with a B years old, we know our formation is that age or younger. And we know that the overlying Jacobsville group is not older than about 950 million years old. So it would be bracketed within there somewhere. Now we do have one intrusion into the Frida that we know of, and it's up on the Keweenaw. It's called the Bear Lake Stock, the Bear Lake Rhyolite, the Bear Lake Felsite, depending on who's writing the paper. But it is definitely an intrusion of a fine-grained felsic rock like a rhyolite. Now that has been dated to about 1.06 billion with a B years old, but the problem is the margin of error on that is huge. It's over 30 million years. So th that intrusion could be anywhere between 1.09 and 1.03 billion with a B years old. And we already know the Frida is not older than 1.08 zero eight billion because we know the age of the underlying none such so that's too big to work with all right we need to narrow this down and plus with detrital zircons i can get a source area i can tell you where the sediments were derived from and we've done this before we do this all the time and sometimes we learn new stuff from doing this like with the baraboo quartzite and the sioux quartzites of wisconsin minnesota those places that we got zircons from there that the only place they could have come from was way up in the Northwest Territories, telling us that that deposit of the purple quartzites like the Baraboon Sioux covered almost the whole continent. And this has happened before, too, and since, we think. So it's not unusual. So if we get something like that, we know that it was sourced from far away. Okay, so you have seen me pull detrital zircons from the field before, so I'm not going to talk too much about that. Now, let's get into why I picked Marble Point. <laughs> I need more sample from the top of the Frida. If you look here, these are my working lab notes. There's not a lot of stuff from the top and middle of the formation. We have a ton of samples from the bottom and about the lower middle of the formation. That's the best part of the Frida that's exposed everywhere, all right? But the top and the middle is a big, huge gap. It's just the way it is. Now, the Frida is dominantly sandstone, but there's siltstones and some shales within it. So west of the Porcupine Mountains, and we're just going to talk about the Frida there because it changes to the east. The Frida west of the Porcupine Mountains is basically three dominant lithologies. A basal conglomerate and coarser grain to medium grain sandstone. A middle fine sandstone and siltstone with some shales and an upper siltstone and fine sandstone to medium sandstone. And the top of that is marked by an erosional unconformity, separating it from the younger Neoproterozoic Jacobsville. That lithology type tends to preserve that bottom coarser stuff better, especially west of the porcupines. Now, east of the porcupines, the formation is slightly different, but the bottom is still the best exposure we have on that side as well. So I need stuff from the top. And I think Marble Bay might be one of those such spots. But why do I think that? Well, first, I'm just going to show you real quickly. 
This is an excerpt of the published map put over Google Earth. It was made in 1996. The marble point location on all these slides is going to be a red circle with a black X on it. So watch for that. Sometimes a red arrow will be pointing to it if it's the map's too busy. So you can see we're in Wisconsin. And you can see to the east, we have the separation between the Upper Peninsula and Wisconsin. That's where the Montreal River outcrop is, where the bottom to lower middle of the formation is really well exposed. Now, there's no known faults over there. So we're not that far from this location. This area is on what's called the Montreal Monocline, which is going to come back later. But you look at this map and you can see, I'm just going to highlight for you, I have a fault with a bunch of question marks on it. That's where they've mapped the Douglas Fault. We'll talk more about that here when we start looking at the gravity and aeromagnetic maps. And down below, you see I have Lake Owen Fault with question marks too. These faults do exist. We know they do. Douglas Fault outcrops at Amnicom Falls in Wisconsin. The Lake Owen Fault seems to become the Keweenaw Fault on the Keweenaw, but there's no way to directly link the two, and they may not physically connect anyway. But you can see the Lake Owen Fault likely does peter out before we even get near the outcrop. You know, it's it's hard to tell, and I'm going to show you why it's hard to pick out these things. And the reason why we don't know where these faults go is because they're buried under glacial stuff. That glacial stuff has totally covered this not well indurated sandstone even though the sandstone is at least a billion years old. So you can see that fault there's somewhat of a question. And this is our area I'm going to be talking about here. Mostly it's our marble point. And you can see why it's called the point. It's a little jut out into Lake Superior. And the Douglas Fault, I think I know why they drew it out there. It has to do with the shoreline. But it's not necessary to, to make this geology work. And remember, you always err on the most simplest model. And I'm going to show you what that is here in a little bit. But before I do that, I'm going to show you some slides from this paper. You can see here, this is just to show you how the fault isn't consistently mapped. This is figure 12, and this is the Douglas Fault in northern Wisconsin. You can see here, they have it petering out before it even gets near our outcrop. This is a zoom out, figure two. And this basically shows you the west half of Lake Superior, the Mid-Continent Rift, and a bunch of the faults associated with them. It's a general big picture thing. It's not meant to be extrapolated down to the smallest detail. You can see here we have something called the Ashland Syncline. That is a real structure. We'll come back to that. And that's key. But here you can see the fault is modeled either at or just north of our location. Uh, this steel fault here, the interesting thing is we don't think that exists anymore. But anyway, that's a talk for another time. So here we have this figure six. And this shows you a zone of gravity offset. Yes, we can use gravity to map the subsurface. You can see here what's called the top of the Nunsuch formation. Now, the Nunsuch is the formation under the Frida. There's no unconformity between the two. They are conformable, and in places they even are gradational into one another or intertongue. And that could be kind of the problem with the way this is interpreted. But this is actually a pretty good map. And what I want you to get out of this is the gravity offset could be a fault, could be a growth fault, could be a strike slip fault with some vertical component to it as well, or it could just be some sort of weird, funky compensational structure. What you see here is this isopack increase on the east side of the structure towards the north, and on the west side, it's towards the south. What's that mean? That is on top of the formation telling you the thickness of the underlying part of the formation. So that tells me where I see 75, that that formation is 75 feet thick. Okay, and you see 100, 100 feet thick, 125, 125, et cetera, et cetera. But what is missing here? What's missing here is that Douglas Fault as per the published 1996 map. It's not anywhere on here, and it should be if it's such a prominent structure through the Frida. Here's an even more zoom out showing you most of the west arm of the Mid-Continent Rift. 
you can see Ontario, Minnesota, Wisconsin, the UP, and even in Iowa. This arm actually extends a lot further south than that, which is not exposed really south of Minnesota anywhere. So that's just a big picture thing. And you can see here the thiel is mapped as some sort of compensational type structure first order accommodation structure as it's called in the legend we don't even know what these things are they they could be compressional structures they could be faults they could be growth faults you know they could be a bunch of things unless somebody puts a drill core right in the middle of one of them we're never gonna know and this final one is figure two this is showing you a basic geologic map of the same area of the previous slide. Just to get you general feel for the formations, you can look at that in detail if you want. This is also interpretive. You can see there's a lot of interpretation in these because most of this is based off subsurface indirect mapping through magnetic surveys or gravity surveys, something like that. We do have drill cores into some of this stuff, but not enough. So our interpretation of the areas, even around Marble Point, is hard to tell. We do know this White's Ridge to the northwest does exist, and the Ashland Syncline is branches off of it to the south. And this could be an explanation in lieu of the Douglas Fault extending towards our area. Okay, let's go through these quick. This is figure 13. This is a gravity anomaly map. It's not very high res. What I want you to get out of this is I want you to see the dark, thin, long running lines. Those have traditionally been interpreted as faults, as you can see here, but there's other faults to be expected that are not thick black lines at this resolution. And it's quite possible that they are not actual faults or some are some aren't something like that this is too low res to really make any reliable interpretation out of and as you can see the authors of the paper didn't do much interpreting here you can see the ashland syncline pretty well on it so the douglas fault as they have it here they have it extending towards where that 96 map had it and that just may be based off the 96 map this publication came out a year later i think it, if it's even there in this area it's more of where the yellow line is <laughs> and this is where i think it is and i'll show you why here in, in the subsequent slides first here's a better resolution map and you can see it's got a lot more we'll just say squiggly lines in it and then you can see the area of the ashland syncline is very smooth and going into lake superior uh, off of Bayfield Peninsula, it's also really smooth. That could be smoothed out from the thick lake deposits, but we're not on the lake, or we are on the lake, but we're, but we, you know, we're extending from the land. We're right on the border of the lake. There's this has good data, and you can see a strong contrast between the squiggly lines where our site is and the smoother lines just to the northwest. I don't think that's fault. I think the reason for that is the underlying harder, more dense Portage Lake volcanics, and like I said at the Montreal river monocline there is no fault between the two contact is exposed and there's no fault and remember don't extrapolate faults if you don't need them so this yellow circle shows our area this is where i think the faults and the red lines actually go and possibly peter out so what's a better explanation well according to this here my interpretation these smoother areas are just fold axes folds in the frida sandstone are a more likely scenario. The Frida sandstone, as you're going to show here, and from my field work and everything else I've seen, it has a maximum, this is absolutely as thick as it's ever going to be, about 15,000 feet. More typically, west of the porcupines, it's closer to 12,000, give or take. Now, folds in the Frida are a much more logical explanation. Why is that? Well, because the Frida... It's not well underrated in most places now as it is. So it was probably loose sediment when it was folded and possibly faulted. And the stuff, the underlying Portage Lake volcanics, which underlie the Aranto group, those are hard, dense rock. Those are lavas. So those, if they're going to move and bend and be deformed, the overlying Frida is most likely just going to fold with it. This stuff is easier to fold than it is to fault. 
So what I've done here is I've done a generalized geologic map based off that 1996 geologic map, taking away all the stuff that's not necessary for what I'm talking about so you can see it better. You can see the north arrow. I don't have a scale on it because there's a scale right here. You can see that we're going to be talking about a cross section from A to A prime from the southeast to the northwest. My basic stratigraphy here, we're not dealing with the glacial stuff. I'm not interested in that. I don't care about that. But the glacial stuff overlies the Jacobsville group and all, all the other units. What I'm interested in is yellow part, the Frida sandstone. Now the Aranto group here, all three formations in the area are exposed. The Frida, the Nunsuch, and the Copper Harbor. The Portage Lake volcanics underlie the whole thing. The Jacobsville is separated from the Frida in other places by an erosional unconformity to the east of the Porcupines. In the St. Amour core and at Pictured Rocks, it is an unconformity, an un erosional slightly angular. But if you look at the map here, you see I have Douglas Fault question mark. This is basically where they've mapped the fault. And if you extrapolate it under Lake Superior, you can see it comes out past the vicinity of Marble Bay. And you can see the strikes and dips on here near the fault are shallow. But you come back to where it's in contact with the Nunsuch, and they're steep, almost vertical. And this 6.64 miles here, that's as a crow flies on the map. And that's about the maximum distance where I don't have to worry about the curve of the Earth. I can just directly measure it. As a crow flies, the Frida appears to be 6.64 miles thick with the Douglas Fault at the top and the younger Jacobsville to the northwest of that even. But it's not that simple. Why would it be? You're going to see the cross sections here and three of the most likely possible scenarios. And you're going to see how likely they are relative to one another. And of course, I'm not going to go in order for you, but I'll talk about them as I show them to you. We are going to start with possibility two, which I have is somewhat likely. This would be our middle probable type scenario. And this is what you get if you base the interpretation off of that 1996 map and use the Douglas Fault. The Douglas Fault, you can see here's my turtles. This is Marble Point, it's over here. And using the other 80 degree dip here, using where they have the fault mapped. Now, if the fault's between the Frida and the Jacobsville, it's gotta go all the way down to the Portage Lake Volcanics. You can't get away from that. There's no reason to fault the Frida, which is a soft unit, but not fault the Portage Lake Volcanics. That doesn't make geologic sense. So this is what you have to do to get it to make geologic sense. And we have no drill cores in this area, this deep to confirm it. There's no vertical exaggeration here. And as you can see, this gives me a total thickness of the Frida of about 15,000 feet, which is that maximum thickness. So there's not a problem there. And that's why this is the middle possibility and not the most least likely. And you can see we would get a tight fold within the Frida. I've done a red axis here for you. And like I've already previously explained, the Frida is not likely to fault like this. <laughs> this would be a huge overthrusted fault with displacements in the order of up to six miles more. That isn't likely, but it's not the least likely scenario. The least likely scenario is this one. Although it's tempting to peter out the Douglas in the subsurface, which is a possibility, and that's actually probably what it does, just not here. This is not a likely solution. Now here, you we know the Montreal monocline exists, so any interpretation we have, and it's close by, has to include that. So that means if the Douglas fault peters out, and uh, with a, not too much of a, you know, offset, you know, maybe at the contact with the underlying none such, maybe half a mile, third of a mile, you know, like a half a kilometer. So it, that isn't weird. And that's kind of logical. And then it peters out. But the problem is our thickness of the Frida. In order to get this to work, the Frida has to be 22,000 feet thick. And that is not anywhere observed. In older 19th, early 20th century publications, you will see it described as possibly this thick, 
or even a lot thinner. But a lot of times they're just talking about what was called the Lake Superior sandstones. That included the Frida, the Jacobsville, and some of the Cambrian sandstones. So you'll see anomalously, ridiculously thick thicknesses. But since then, we've divided these things out. We have a good understanding of what they want to be. And the weird thing is, <laughs> in a lot of the older maps, it shows the area having a lot of anticlines and synclines and not a lot of faults. But they didn't know about the Douglas and Lake Owen faults then. Like I said, those two do exist. It's like we went from accepting folds to using these faults as an explanation for the border of these things. So we went from the simplest solution to a more complex one. Why do we opt to map the faults, just pull these faults? Well, several reasons. One, because all this stuff right here and where I need to be is covered by glacial stuff. So there's no way to directly observe it. So bounding faults are, and extrapolating them are an easy, quick solution so you don't have to deal with the tight folding that's more likely to exist in between. But in order for me to do this, we need to worry about reality, not map convenience. The folds are actually the simpler explanation than the faults, but the faults make it easy and convenient for mapping purposes. But here you can see that my turtles, where the marble point is, are at the top of our formation, which is what I want. Now, in the previous one, if you look at it and take it down and go down to where the nun such is and come back up, we would be closer to the bottom, middle, or middle of the formation, and I already have all my samples from that. Is there any way to confirm if I'm near the top or middle of the formation? And yes, there is. Like I said, I know that the that there's basically three lithologies of the Frida. If I see a at Marble Point, a coarser grained sandstone and even some possibly some conglomerates, I could be towards the middle. And that would make this possibility to the actual interpretation. But if I see finer sandstones or silty sandstones, I'm going to know I'm near the top of the formation, which makes my possibility one, my most likely interpretations. This is what I think is actually going on here in that marble point outcrop. And as you can see, we're still near the top of the formation, so I need that sample. And our known thickness, 15,000 feet, works here. And we have our Montreal monocline, and we don't need to mess with that. And the reason why I have the Frida likely thins here to the, to the south is because we know it does. It eventually peters out, we know this. Uh, and there's places in the Portage Lake Volcanics where the Ronto group is practically non-existent. So we know it thins that way. And it could thicken to thicker than the 15,000 feet under Lake Superior. The 15,000 feet thickness, I believe, is a maximum thickness. I don't think it gets any thicker than that. That's depositional thickness, by the way. Now, of course, if you fold it and fault it, you can mess with the thickness. But that's actual depositional thickness. And so this makes sense. And as you can see, we have a syncline where I put the axis here and the anticline where I did not put an axis. But you see we are near the top of the formation. And either way, if one or three is correct, I'm going to get the sample I need. And I'll be able to tell that by the lithology that I've already explained. So I think this is what's actually going on. I think those early day interpretations of a lot of folds in the area, we know that about the Ashland syncline, that's an actual thing, that those are more likely interpretations of what's happening in the Oronto group locally than putting a bunch of faults in just to make it easy to map. But I'll know when I get out there. And like I said, we're going to have to access this via boat or a very long walk along the shore. And so we're going to have to wait till next year. It's it's winter now. It's December 21st as I'm recording this. Um, I will get those detrital zircons. Yes, I will. And just to show you here, these are my field notes. This is just to show you my modeling of the Frida formation and my relative locations within the formation not how they are in a map but where they are within the formation this is the stuff near the bottom look at all that stuff there's stuff all over the place the red ones are my detrital samples see so you can see from the bottom to the lower middle we have decent exposure then 
through most of the middle and the top, there's almost nothing. You get a couple of samples here, but smack dack in the middle, there's really only two things. That's why I had to go back at to Red Ridge and get that Red Ridge sample. Otherwise, I would only have the St. Amore core, which I have not taken samples from yet. I will do that probably this winter or early spring. So my Marble Bay needs to be up in this area. Otherwise, I'm just stuck with the St. Amore once again. And the problem with the St. Amore core is I do need it for those detritals, but it's way east of the Porcupine Mountains. It is completely buried, the Frida, in this core. It's a beautiful core. And I looked at it when I did the Jacobsville, but it's the only core we have that has the entire Frida drilled through it. I and mean, the core, these cords are wide. Uh, they're four to two inches. Two inches is the smallest diameter you get in these cores. And now usually when they go this deep, you get one inch cores at the best. This is the interpretation of the St. Amour core. And this is why I'm picking those. Sam, you can see the Jacobsville overlies it. I didn't take any detritals from it or any samples. I didn't need to because that's already been done. But uh, anyway, I think that's it. I think this is long enough. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And I hope you learned something.